Pastor Tony is not here. He's out in Ecuador. So make sure that you uh, keep him in your prayers. We have Pastor Dennis and his wife here, Bebby Jo, uh, guest speaking. So thank you very much uh, for coming out. Um, we'll get started right away with announcements, Kimmy. Okay, so I just want to start out with telling you how good God is. So if you want to pull up that slide. So that is Grace and Tony with all of the underwear that you guys had. Like, We were packing it and we're like, oh my gosh, we might need another suitcase, but it fit perfect like a glove. Um, one of the things that I did to Tony, and I had to apologize to him, was um, I gave him an hour and 15 minute layover in Miami. And um, so I was like, take lots of snacks. You're not going to have time to get coffee. You're not going to have time to, like, grab food. Like, you're going to hustle from one gate to another. I was like, I'm really sorry. I was like, but it was, like, the best option. So he was like, okay. They took lots of snacks. They had fruit snacks. They had granola bars. They were ready. Their flight got to Miami 30 minutes early. The gate that they landed and came in was the same gate that they left out of. So they had some good time to potty break, find coffee, get food, and get back to their gate. So God is good, and they arrived safely. So um, the caring treat, y'all took tags. Thank you. If you could please, please, please have them back by uh, Sunday. If you can get them to me sooner, drop them off during the week. I'm here from 11 to 2. I'll take it. Um, and I appreciate that. You guys are amazing. I also forgot to get a picture of the food drive, but uh, Harvest, the food pantry, was super blessed. So thank you for that one. So the Gems is having a Christmas breakfast with a little bit of a gift swap on December 3rd at 9.30. Beth, did you want to say anything about that? And there's always good food. Ladies only, ladies only. So uh, Digging Deep is taking a break. Uh, they will see you next year. And Unbottling is also taking a break, and they will see you next year. And I think that is all for announcements. If I could have Buddy and, and Jay come up for the offering. All right, well, pray over the offering. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. Lord God, thank you for this time that we can gather together to worship you, to learn about your word, Lord God, to bring forth our tithes and offerings, Lord. We pray that you bless them, use them for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You can bring up your tithes and offerings. Then right after this, we'll have a short time of greeting and then to worship.
worship. The first song that we have here is Come Thou Fount. It's been a little while since we've done this one. This is one of my favorites, a devotional song for me. Um, Come Thou Fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. It's that mercy in just goes on. God's mercy, you know, is infinite. It goes on. It's new every morning. Uh, It calls for songs of loudest praise. And then it says, this this song can be somewhat of a word salad if you don't, if you're just singing it for the first time, but uh, when you really get into it, teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above singing that spiritual song. Lord, teach me. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it. That's just the first verse. And then just one more. When we get to that second verse, if you haven't heard this song before, it says, Here I raise my Ebenezer. You're going to be going, what is that? And if you go back to the book of Samuel, you'll see at the point the ark had been taken away by the Philistines, brought back, and uh, and then the Philistines came to attack them, Israel, in fear. Then God came and, and rescued them. It was a thunder, sent confusion in the enemy's camp, and one thing that Samuel did after, he raised a stone, and he said, this is Ebenezer, this is the stone of help, for thus far the Lord has helped us, and we do that in life, right? It's a testimony, basically. We lay that stone down, and we say, thus far the Lord has helped me. And then you're going to, hopefully, you're going to be laying down another stone. And as this song uh, goes on, uh, we hope to safely arrive at home. That is our, that is our goal. We're, we're forward looking to our heavenly home. We just thank you. Come thou fount of every blessing. Streams of 
of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me what you have done for us, God. We thank you for your word, God. And I thank you, Lord, for the Christmas season and that the light of the world has come. The living hope has come. And Jesus, you said, I am the light of the world and I am here. And we are grateful. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We invite your light into this room. Shine so brightly. Shine so brightly as we lift your name higher and higher, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus is your name. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. This is one of my favorites because we did it in VBS, and children are great in VBS. They do all the motions. They do the jumping. So if you feel like you're in VBS today, go right ahead. Do the motions and do the jumping. It's all good. He's our lighthouse. He's the hope, the living hope that we can follow. Amen.
this song means more than the building. It means your very being inside of you, of how mighty he is. I know I have Christmas on my brain. Maybe you're not ready for it. But singing these songs and thinking how long ago the prophecy was given that in darkness a light was coming, the living hope, which was Jesus, counselor, wonderful, would be coming. Falling down, the shepherds came. What did they do? They fell down right at a little baby's feet. So Jesus has been from beginning till now, till eternity. And he's not wanting to be just awesome in this building when you come. He wants to be awesome on the inner side of you. That you magnify, that you, that we, we all, including myself, we magnify him in everything we do. And guess what? We get peace and we get joy along the way, and we get mercy, and we get redemption. There's so much. So as you sing this song, maybe apply more to your heart if you're ready for that. Be more awesome in me. He's in there. Hallelujah. Let him speak to you. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. He is good. He is good. And would like to invite uh, Pastor Dennis Marquardt to speak. Thank you. Uh, I just want to take the time to thank you for your service as superintendent for all those years. It's appreciated. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Great thank, you. thank you. Good morning, church. Good morning. 
hey, now that I'm retired, I got all the time in the world, so I'm going to preach the whole Old Testament and New Testament today. <laughs> That's sort of a joke, but it, actually I kind of will today. I want to share a passage of Scripture that was a very controversial passage of Scripture when it was written to the audience it was given to. But when I read it to you, you're going to say, what's so controversial about that? But I think you'll catch it as we go along a little bit. Many people, including Christians, they just did a recent survey, and most Christians don't feel overly comfortable with God. Christians. And the reason is, is we know God is so holy and so marvelous and so great, and we know really what we are and how often we fail him and sin. And most Christians are a little uncomfortable with God, even though they're grateful for his salvation. That's generally true. They did a survey, and it was overwhelmingly that Christians are almost a little bit afraid of God. And... Uh, both saint and sinners alike sometimes just kind of wonder what he's really like. We often feel God is so far above us that he's so awesome and so powerful that we're a bit afraid of him. Is that true? I mean, I feel that way sometimes. If we make mistakes or sin here and there, we worry that God's going to get us. Well, I'm here with some good news today. Uh, it's a little bit like, let me, let me illustrate this. Several years ago, there was a lady who had pulled up to a stoplight, and on her left side, uh, one of those truck, big trucks pulled up alongside of her, and the truck driver could look down into her car and saw this woman, this, this very pretty girl, driving the car and started motioning to her and made her feel really uncomfortable, so she, as soon as it turned green light, she took off, thinking, I'm getting away from this truck driver. So she took off. When she took off, that truck driver just barreled that truck as fast as he could and got on her tail. Well, the more he stayed on her tail, the more nervous she got. She thought, this guy is following me. So she got on the interstate and thought, I'll lose him on the interstate. But he must have had an empty truck at the time because he was able to keep up with her. And she got more and more scared of this guy and this truck driver following her. So she tried taking a couple of exits off the interstate and when she exited, guess who exited with her? The truck driver. So now she's really panicking. She's thinking, this guy is chasing me. So she thought, what am I going to do? So she got back on the interstate and then got back off on another exit, and he did the same thing, followed her, stayed right on her tail. And so she thought, the only thing I know to do is pull into a gas station, jump out of the car, go to the attendant in the gas station, ask them to call the police. So she pulled suddenly into this one gas station, jumped out of the car, ran into the, the lobby area, asking the guy to call the police. And to her amazement, the truck driver pulled into the same gas station, and he jumped out of the car. But instead of chasing her into the lobby, he went to her car, opened the back door, and pulled a rapist out of the back seat that had been hiding. Oh. The guy that she was running from proved to be her savior. He wasn't there to harm her, he was there to save her. But she didn't know that, and she was running from the wrong person. That's what sinners are doing with God. They're running from the very one who's trying to save them, but they're panicked about him. And sometimes we as Christians uh, have this uncomfortable relationship with God because we know ourselves, we know our sins, we know our failures, and we often don't feel as good about our relationship with God as we really should feel. So we're going to look at that this morning. In the Old Testament times, and I really am going to take us through some of the Old Testament, but I'll do it much quicker than you think. Um, in the Old Testament, it was really, really scary to come into God's presence. Wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, when, remember when Moses was leading the children of Israel out and and God had called him up into the mountain and spoke to him directly. And then at one point, God told Moses, gather the people at the base of the mountain and I will speak to them. So he got all the Israelites together at the base of the mountain to hear God speak to them. And as God began to thunder and lightning and, and we got ready to speak, the people all said, no, I don't think we want to do this. You go talk to him and tell us what he wants. Because they were scared. Because the idea in the Old Testament was... 
God was so awesome. When they went through the wilderness, he was a pillar of fire um, at night and a, and a cloud by day that stayed above the, the, the sanctuary, the uh, tabernacle. And the only ones who ever had direct access to God in the Old Covenant was a very, very select few. In fact, only the high priest got to go into the Holy of Holies when they had the Ark of the Covenant. Only once a year could he even go in there, remember? So it was kind of scary to have a relationship with God, and a lot of people were excluded from getting too close to him. But when we get to the New Testament, I want you to turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 9, and we're going to read a verse here that actually, when it was written, was very, very controversial. And you might not think of that. Um, Let's go to the next slide there, if we could. Here's what the passage says. Now, the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up. In its first room were the lampstand, the table, and the consecrated bread. That was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered Ark of the Covenant. This Ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the Covenant. Next slide. Above the Ark were the cherubim of the glory overshadowing the atonement cover, but we cannot discuss these things in detail now. When everything had been arranged like this, The priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry, but only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year and never without blood, which he offered for himself and the sins the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still standing. Next slide. Oh, that was the end? Didn't I get to the passage, uh, the first passage? Did we skip that slide about enter into the, yeah. Oh, there we go. This is uh, chapter 4, Hebrews 4, 16. I want you to read this, ver- listen to this verse. Let us approach the throne of grace with what? A King James, I think, says boldly. Uh, but with confidence so that we might receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. When this was sent to the audience that received this, this was controversial. What's the name of the book that we're looking at? I mean, what's the book that this is written in? Hebrews. That's a really important clue. Who were the Hebrews? These were Old Testament Jewish people that had embraced the Messiah, but were still thinking like Old Testament Jews. And to an Old Testament Jew... Coming into the presence of God, you didn't come boldly, you came very scaredly. Because only the high priest even got to go into the actual presence of God behind the curtain. Remember there was a big curtain before the the Ark of the Covenant? And only the high priest could go in there once a year, and he had to have blood. And it was so scary. Jewish. There's some additional Jewish uh, writings, one of them is called the Talmud. And some of the Old Testament uh, Talmud writings about Jewish high priests were that once in a while they lost a high priest. You know why? He went behind the curtain into the Holy of Holies with sin in his heart, not prepared correctly. And when he got before the mercy seat of God, which was on the top of the Ark of the Covenant, where the blood was to be sprinkled, guess what happened to him? God killed him because he came in unclean. How many of you would have volunteered to be the high priest? And the Talmud says that a couple times, that it's not recorded in the scriptures, but in the Talmud it says that there were a couple high priests who died so that the Jewish people, what they got accustomed to doing was they tie a rope around his waist or they put bells on the bottom of his robe so that if they heard the jingling stop, they knew he dropped dead and they would drag him out with the rope. And they had to do that a couple times. So it was scary. The idea of being in the actual presence of God was a frightening thing, and you didn't take that lightly. You certainly didn't go in there boldly. You went in there very carefully. And and only that one guy out of millions had the privilege of actually going into the actual presence of God, which was in that Holy of Holies, was where the fire was and where the smoke was above the, the mercy seat, and that was the actual presence of God. And Can you imagine being the high priest and walking in there once a year? Boy, you made sure your heart was clean. And you made sure you had the blood of the lamb to sprinkle on the mercy seat properly. You made sure you understood all the rules and regulations and you did everything perfectly. You know, we as Christians sometimes still feel that way about God. If we don't do everything just perfect and just right, he's going to get us. 
But I got news for you. This was written to a group of Hebrews in the New Testament because the writer, and we don't know who the writer of Hebrews, it was possibly the Apostle Paul that wrote the book of Hebrews. It might have been Barnabas. We don't have an actual proof of who wrote the book of Hebrews. It was somebody that knew Paul because some of the language is Pauline. But whoever it was was writing to the Jewish people because this was a radical concept for Hebrews to have that they could now come into the throne room of God boldly. That was a foreign concept. And we'll, we'll look at that here. And Go to the next slide now. This was the Old Testament. This was also the Temple of Solomon. The tabernacle and the temple later were built basically the same, uh, same uh, setup, even though they were a little different sizes. But you can see that the outside of the temple there, uh, the Bronze Sea, and some of the stuff that was on the outside, uh, some of the Jewish people could go on the outside of the temple, but no Jews could go on the inside. Only Levites could go into the actual, the holy place, which is the first room, the nave there. Only Levites were allowed in there, and they took turns ministering at those altars periodically. And that Holy of Holies was the only place once a year that the high priest went into, behind that thick curtain. And I'm going to tell you, that curtain was heavy, and it was thick. If you read the Old Covenant, uh, the Old Testament passages, that curtain was made up of many, many layers with gold threads. It was super heavy. It must have been almost impossible to move it to the side even to get behind it. So that was uh, Solomon's temple. Go to the next slide. Next slide. Now, when Luke is writing about the Old Covenant, he said, Our forefathers had the tabernacle of the testimony with them in the desert. It has been made as God directed Moses according to the pattern he had seen. Having received the tabernacle, our fathers under Joshua brought it with them when they took the land from the nations God drove out before them. It remained in the land until the time of David. Uh, this more text, who enjoyed God's favor and asked that he might provide a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built the house for him. However, the Most High does not live in houses made by men. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord, or where will my resting place be? Has not my hands made all these things? In other words, Solomon made this beautiful temple, uh, for God's presence. And when they dedicated that temple, what happened? Do you remember on the day it was dedicated? The presence of God came down so powerfully in that new dedication of that temple that it drove the priests out because the presence of God was so powerful they couldn't handle it. So how do you think that made them feel about being in God's presence? A little nervous. Um, by the way, a similar thing happened in the dedication of the tabernacle in the wilderness when that was dedicated, fire fell from heaven and consumed the sacrifice, and all the Israelites saw the power of God fall on that, that fire that fell. That's what happened on Solomon's temple, too, is the fire fell and the presence of God was so powerful it drove them out. By the way, I think that's, that fire falling is really significant in the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost. Remember, it says there was a ball of fire that came into the room. That was God's way of saying, as under the old covenant, that that ball of fire was, I accept the church now as my building. That, that's my temple. And then a, a, the fire separated, and a tongue of fire went over each believer. And Paul actually alludes to this in 1 Corinthians when he says, don't you know that you all are the temple of the Holy Spirit? And then in another passage, three chapters earlier, he says, don't you know that your body is also a temple of the Holy Spirit? So that fire falling on Pentecost, only hap it only happened once, in the dedication of the tabernacle, the fire only fell once in Solomon's temple. It only fell once on the day of Pentecost, but separated one over. I think that was God trying to tie the old covenant into the new covenant by saying, I don't need buildings now. I don't need a tabernacle. I don't need Solomon's temple because I dwell in my church and I dwell in you as my believers. That's a powerful, powerful truth being revealed there. Is there another more text to that yet? Next slide. No? Okay, this is good. This was the Jerusalem temple in Jesus' day, and you can see the layout here. I don't know if you can read all these, the, these uh, parts here. But the court of the Gentiles is the area where 12 is. You see where number 12 is? If you were a Gentile in Jesus' day, you were allowed to worship God, but you couldn't get very close. You were in this outer courtyard here uh, where number 12 is, 
That was the court of the Gentiles. If, as a Gentile, that was as close as you could get to God, was that outer, that outer area. So even a Gentile wanting to worship God couldn't come very close to God. He was in the outer court. Actually, uh, the court of the women were, was actually closer to God. The women, women were better. Jewish women were in better stead with God than Gentile men. Because their court was number nine, and you can see number nine there was sort of on the inside. That was the court of the women. The women were allowed to come closer to the presence of God than Gentile men were. And in, ver- in area four, is, or area five, is the court of the priests. This was where the Levites would serve. And uh, so they were by the, the altar, and et cetera. And then the altar of incense and the holy place were where the rotating priests would go in, and they would take turns and weekly uh, responsibilities. And then, of course, number one there is the Holy of Holies, and we already know that was the only place that only one guy could go in on only once a year, on the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur, as we call it today. And that's where the high priest would enter with the blood of the Lamb, to uh, to sprinkle on the mercy seat of God for God to forgive all the sins of the people. And only after he came back out successfully did the people of God really feel like they had been forgiven by God and were now acceptable. So it was a kind of a a once-a-year thing. Uh, So the approach to God was very selective, and it was very carefully outlined, and it was very careful how you approach God. Um, Aren't you glad we're living under the new covenant? Because the Old Covenant, it was nice. You could have a relationship with God, but it was kind of a little frightening and a little scary. It was so scary that when they moved in the, in the Old Testament, when they were moving and going, the tabernacle was going across the wilderness, they had to dismantle the, the tabernacle and carry it, that if the, the priests were the only ones allowed to carry the Ark of the Covenant and they had to carry it on their shoulders with sticks, they couldn't actually touch the Ark of the Covenant. And if somebody was ready to stumble and fall and you reached out and touched the Ark of the Covenant to keep it from falling off, what happened to you? You died instantly. There's a couple of inst- stories in the Old Covenant and Old Testament that actually describe that happening where one, one Jewish guy, uh, the cart had hit a bump or something and he was afraid it was going to fall. He reached out and touched the Ark of the Covenant and he died instantly. It made you really think about God's presence. I mean, it was scary, the idea of being a follower of God in the Old Covenant. Go to the next slide. Then we get this really interesting passage when Jesus is hanging on the cross and he's about to pass away. It said, when Jesus cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. This is in Matthew. At the moment, the curtain of the temple, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open, and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. Is that the end of the text, or is there more on the next? Oh, they came out of the tombs, and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many men. When the centurion and those who were with him and were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the Son of God. Do you understand the import of this little story tucked into the Gospel of Matthew? Jesus is dying. He's about ready to give up his last breath. As he dies and takes his last breath in the temple in Jerusalem, where the priests and the high priest may have been at that time of the year because they were getting ready for all the celebrations of Passover, the high priest was probably getting ready to go behind that curtain. Think of this. Uh, show the curtain there. That's, that, that's the curtain before the Ark of the Covenant. It was massive. It was heavy. Uh, no individual could have just gone up there and torn the curtain. I mean, that would have been implausible because it was actually probably a foot thick with all these different layers and everything. But as Jesus dies on Calvary, there's this little insertion in the Gospel of Matthew that says when he gave up his last breath, and probably is when he said, it is finished, there was a giant earthquake in Jerusalem And the curtain in the temple of God is ripped in half from top to bottom. Can you imagine being a priest or the high priest that day inside the temple? Uh, The high priest might have been okay, but the priests who were never allowed to go into the the Holy of Holies, when that curtain ripped in half, what do you think they did? They probably went, oh no, don't look, don't look. But that was a powerful message from God to the Jewish people 
that I want you to know there's no longer restriction. There's no way that you should ever fear coming into my presence. My presence has been open for all because of my son, Jesus Christ. He took his own blood and went to heaven and on the mercy seat of God sprinkled his own blood and became the ultimate sacrifice that the old covenant was looking forward to and fulfilled the conditions that made the sacrifice for our sins. So now there needs to no longer be a high priest. Jesus himself was our high priest and it doesn't need to be any barriers. God says, now you can come to me boldly. Now we can come to him confidently. God opened up that curtain so that there's no restrictions, no fallbacks. Listen, I know I'm not perfect. You can ask my wife. We've been married over 50 years. She'll tell you I'm not perfect. Um, I've been in ministry for 50 years, and I'm still struggling with stuff at times. Uh, and sometimes we can feel like God maybe doesn't, isn't overly pleased with us. But I want you to know that's not how God feels about us. God wants us as his people. If you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he wants you to know that you can come boldly into his throne. And make requests. In fact, let's go, I want to show you the curtain torn because that's what happened. Can you imagine that guy, that high priest there, seeing that happen that day? He probably was, he might have been actually in the tabernacle at the time because this was the Passover leading to the final time when the high priest went in when the curtain was ripped. And to his horror, he sees the Ark of the Covenant now freely available to the Levites, to the court of Gentiles, to the court of women, to the, to the Jewish people. In general, it was wide open to the mercy seat of God because of what Jesus Christ did. This was powerful. And this was so amazing. And this was hard to swallow to this group of people that was called Hebrews, which this book was written to. Because these were the Jewish people that still embraced a lot of the Old Covenant in their thinking because they were raised that way. And even though they had accepted Jesus as Savior in the New Covenant under the New Testament by Paul's teaching and other people's teaching, they were still struggling with the idea that, well, you know, God maybe through Jesus has made us saved so we don't have to do blood sacrifices of lambs anymore. But they probably still were carrying that mentality that, boy, you don't want to get too close to God. That it would be scary to get real close to God. And the writer here in the Hebrews wants to, them to get rid of that notion. He wants them to understand that this was a radical change by God for God's people. That we can come boldly. No longer do we need a Moses to go up and speak to God directly and come down and communicate to us. No longer do we need a high priest that's... Uh, I don't mean this to be disparaging on, on Roman Catholics uh, at all, but there was an interesting story of a blind woman who was in a hospital dying. Uh, the hospital staff didn't know what her spiritual condition was, and so she was getting ready to pass away. They sent a Catholic priest up to see her to, to give her last rites and forgive her sins. And so one of the nurses introduced the priest. He came in, and, he, and she said, Who are you and why are you here? And he said, I've come to forgive your sins. And he took her hands to pray for her. And as soon as he took her hands, she pushed his hands away. And he was a little startled. He said, what's the matter? He said, well, the man who can forgive my sins has nail prints in his hands and you have none. Because we don't need a priest to go between us and God anymore. Jesus Christ made it possible for us to come directly to him. Do you know how powerful that is? We don't need an intermediary. We don't, need an, uh, uh, we don't need an Aaron as a high priest or anybody else as high priest. We don't even need a pastor. It's not the pastor that gets you into heaven. It's your own personal relationship with God and the way is wide open for you to come boldly into his presence and to ask boldly. We're going to check the rest of that verse in a minute. Go to the next slide. So here's what, here's what the writer says to these Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 4, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. And next slide. So let us there then approach the throne of grace with confidence or boldly, so that we might receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. 
Sometimes we as God's people even, even as Christians, we fail to come to God to ask things because we think, well, I wasn't very good this week. And he's not going to be pleased enough with me to want to answer my prayers. Come on, I don't think I'm alone on this. And like I said, this recent study that was done, probably almost three quarters of Christians feel this way regularly with their relationship with God. But that's not what I read in Hebrews. Because if any group of people would have felt that way, it was these Hebrews who would have felt, uh, we have to be a little cautious about coming into God's presence. And Barnabas or Paul, whoever wrote Hebrews, said, no, that's not the way God sees it. God ripped the curtain in half on purpose because he doesn't want any barrier between you and him anymore. He don't, you don't need the high priest. You don't need the Levites anymore. You don't need the pastor. You just need to come boldly into my presence and find mercy and help in your time of need. That means you don't have to earn this goodness from God. You don't have to be so good and so sin-free this week that maybe on a really good week, God might answer your prayer. I want you to know you can come boldly and confidently in the presence of God anytime, even when we fail. Even when we fail, God is not capricious enough that every time we sin, he's holding it. It's not a whack a Remember the whack-a-mole thing that you knock the things down? Some of us have that concept of God in our relationship with him, that every time we do something wrong, he whacks us on the head, and he's not going to answer our prayers. But that's not what we read in the scriptures Let us approach the throne of grace with confidence, or boldly, as King James says, so that we can receive mercy and find grace. Is there any restrictions on that? Is it restricted in any way? I don't read it that way. It just says if we belong to Jesus Christ, we've accepted him as our Savior, in spite of our failures, our weaknesses, our lack of maturity, whatever it might be, we can still come into his presence boldly. And there's so many examples of that in the New Testament where somebody hardly had faith, even the faith of a mustard seed, and they had great miracles done for them by Jesus. Some of the people who didn't even know who Jesus were received healing and miracles because their friends believed and brought them to Jesus. So you can't earn God's goodness. You can't earn God's mercy. It's not going to be based on how good you are. or how. And I'm not saying this to be sloppy in our walk with God either. But it's not going to be based on all the things that we sometimes think it's based on, because we think that way with with our kids and stuff. You know, we don't reward our kids when they're bad. And we sometimes postulate that uh, heavenly-wise, too. But that's not the God we serve, because Jesus knows the end from the beginning, and he redeemed us and washed us by his blood. He's cleansed all our sins, all the sins I committed before I became saved to the day I die have been washed by the blood of the Lamb. That doesn't mean I get sloppy in my relationship, because if you understand God's love, when somebody loves you that much, you want to do a lot for them. You don't want to just be sloppy in your relationship with them. Uh, What's the next slide say? So here's what Paul wrote to the Corinthians. Based on our knowledge of this, he says, as God's partners, we beg you not to accept this marvelous gift of God's kindness and then ignore it. For God says, at just the right time I heard you. On the day of salvation I helped you. Indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. If you're waiting, I don't know who you are in this place, but if you're waiting to think when I get good enough, when I clean my life up enough, then I'll come to God, that's not what God wants. He wants you to come as you are. All the ways that we are, he wants us to come, and he wants us to come not with fear and not with shame. He doesn't want us to come kind of, uh, well, God, if, if you're not too mad at me this week, would you help me out? He wants us to come boldly and confidently. That means I can come into his presence anytime and ask for help, and trust me, he will hear you. And I don't think we do that enough. To ask, because many times we not really believe that he's going to come through because we know who we are. But I want you to know God will come through a whole lot more than you think he will. You have not because you ask not. Not because of how good you are. My wife's going to come up on this beautiful song that ties all of this together for us, and she's going to sign it for you, but we'll put the video up on here. And then when she's done, I'm going to give a few instructions and we'll close. Be 
could enter therein to offer up a sacrifice for atonement of sin. But the veil was rent in an instant, revealing that holy place. For on a hill nearby, on a rugged cross, justice that This was such a powerful truth that we need to understand. In just a second, we're going to do that. We're going to pray. I know there's people online watching too. And I want you to know, if you haven't made a relationship with God, the way is wide open because of Jesus Christ. Uh, years ago in Utah, there was a, a, a police officer. I can't remember his first name. His last name was Preston. Um, he was teaching a class to a bunch of uh, new cadets that were just coming into the police force. And so they were in plain clothes. They were in the, the, the library at their city. They were using the library for a place to uh, teach a class. And so he was in there teaching his class. His class was over. He had dismissed the students. He was dressed in plain clothes because it wasn't an official function kind of a thing. And as he came out of the room, all the students had already left. Uh, as he kind of wrapped up his stuff and he walked out into the hallway, he walked out into the hallway and noticed that 19 people were being rounded up by a gunman who was going to execute them. And he thought, what do I do? I'm a police officer, but I'm dressed in plain clothes. And so he didn't know what to do. He didn't have a phone to make a phone call. 
So the only thing he could think of is he slipped into the hostages and became one of them. He, he figured the guy probably didn't do an accurate count, didn't actually count 19 people. He counted 19. But he thought, well, I'm going to hope the guy didn't count how many there were. And he just slipped in with the crowd. And when they went into the room and the gunman locked the room and then called some authorities and said, I'm going to execute one hostage every five minutes. I don't care what you do. He stepped to be the first one in line. And as he came up and the gunman put the gun to his head, he knocked the guy's hand out, pulled his own gun out, which he had hidden under his sweater, and uh, wrestled the guy to the floor and saved all the hostages. That's what Jesus did. We got Christmas coming up. He slipped into humanity as one of us. Uh, he was the eternal son of God, and he became a human being and slipped in amongst us hostages. And the enemy didn't know who he was, really. Satan thought he won that day on the cross, but all he did was liberate all the Old Testament saints and all the New Testament saints so that we have free access to Almighty God. I want you to bow your heads, eyes closed. First thing I want to ask is if there's anybody here who has never opened your heart and life to Jesus, I want you to know Jesus will not, not push you away. He will not keep you away. He desires you to come in a relationship. I don't care what you've done or how bad you've been. That will not hold God's hand away from you. And he just wants you to come and ask for forgiveness of those sins. And he will wash and make of you a new creature. If you've never done that, you're not sure you've ever made a right relationship with God a reality. I want you to do something simple while heads are bowed and eyes are closed. This won't embarrass you in any way. I want you just to briefly slip up your hand so I can see it. I want to pray for you. And I want you to know God wants you to come. Anyone in this place, just slip your hand up briefly, and then you can put it right back down again. Anyone? Yes, sir. Is there anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Anybody else? I don't want to miss anybody. I want to pray for these two individuals, and if anybody online is watching and, and you want to make that decision, please call the church here, Riverside, and talk to Pastor Tony or somebody on the board to uh, let them know of your decision so they can talk to you further. But let me pray for these two, and then I'm going to do something else after this. Father, I thank you for these two hands that were raised, this gentleman and this woman. Pray, God, that they will now experience the grace of God, which cleanses us all from our sins. Father, wash them clean and let them know that you love them and that you want to walk with them and that they don't have to hesitate coming to you. Father, just let them understand the way is clear to have a relationship with Almighty God if we come asking boldly, confidently. And so I pray and thank you, Lord, for these two commitments and pray that if there's any others out there that are watching online, that they too will experience the joy and uh, forgiveness of sins and the relationship that they can have with God. For those of you that might be here this morning, some of you might be sick or struggling with something, I want you to know that we're going to take a time of prayer up here at the altar if you want to come and ask God boldly. He says he will give liberally to those who ask boldly and confidently and will offer help in the time of trouble and of need. So we'll pray for the sick. If you're sick and you want prayer, uh, we want you to come. And we're just going to take a moment here. Uh, if there's some board members here or some leaders in the church, if there are worship team people, uh, come up and help us pray if we get a number of people up here. But if you want prayer for anything, would you just come up to the altar right now while everybody else remains in attitude? Maybe you could just play that video softly in the background again while we're praying for people. And as we remain in attitude of prayer, anyone that wants prayer, please come. Don't feel ashamed. God's not ashamed to have you ask boldly and confidently. And we will pray for you. All right.